Manchuria in northern China. This frozen river marks the boundary with North Korea, the most secretive country in the world. Across the river, North Korean frontier guards are on constant patrol. They have orders to open fire on anyone who tries to cross. On the Chinese side, cameras are forbidden. This footage was filmed in secret. Both China and North Korea would rather we didn't show these pictures. A Chinese man whose identity cannot be revealed agrees to take us quite openly halfway across the river, but no further. An outline on the ice slowly begins to emerge. The woman was hoping to cross the border undetected, but North Korean marksmen opened fire on her. Every month, hundreds of desperate people, like this woman, attempt to flee North Korea, one of the worst dictatorships in the world. They risk their lives trying to escape unnoticed into South Korea. Our documentary, filmed over a 12-month period, looks at would-be refugees from the north and will follow the fate of one group of fugitives on their perilous journey to freedom. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea, a communist dictatorship and a prison for its population. The leader, Kim Jong-il, is a tyrant who finances a nuclear program by starving his people of food. North Koreans secretly filmed these pictures. In the food markets, there's virtually nothing to buy. Ten years ago, a famine killed an estimated two million people. Today, history may be repeating itself. People feed off almost anything they can find on the ground. Children scour the garbage for a scrap to eat. In an attempt to survive, many would risk everything to escape. But crossing directly into South Korea is impossible. The border is impenetrable. A no-man's land 248 kilometers long and four kilometers wide through which the armies of the two sister nations have been facing off for the past 50 years. Minefields and watchtowers on both sides. 700,000 North Korean and 410,000 South Koreans are massed along the border. For those who want to escape, the only way out is the route north into China through that country and on to Laos and eventually Thailand, the only country in Southeast Asia that will allow North Koreans to travel on to Seoul. We are in China on the banks of the River Tuman. We're here to meet a North Korean trafficker who bribes the border guards to ensure the fugitives safe passage. Tonight, he's helping a woman to get across. The crew films discreetly. The trafficker appears out of the gloom of North Korea. He's naked, his clothes wrapped in a plastic bag to keep them dry so as not to arouse suspicion when he later crosses back to return home. He's alone. The woman he was meant to see across has not shown up. But he's not empty handed. Almost anything can be traded across this river. Yeah, 
이게 뭐야? 예, 약입니다. 야? 예. 이거 얼마나 됐어? 백구. 이게 뺑굽이라는 게입니다. 만들어서 는 국경연선으로 국가 미수도 하는 것도 있겠지만 개인들이 기본 돈을 많이 가지고 있길래 어. 개인들이 많이 한가고 저거 저거 저. 제야 500g 음. 한 킬로 이렇게 했어요. 음. 그런데 음. 저, 저게 한 킬로 정도는 있습니다. 집에? 네, 우리 형네 집에 한 킬로 음. 정도 있는데 가격으로 말씀드린다면 한 킬로로 만 음. 오천 달러. 음? 달러로? 네. 오케이. 다른 사람들도 많이 해야? 네, 하는 거는 법적입니다. 그래? The man accuses the Kim Jong-il dictatorship of controlling a huge traffic in drugs. In January 2007, a report by the U.S. Congress claimed the North Korean drug trade was worth one billion dollars a year. North Korea is a hooligan state where corruption is institutionalized. <laughs> 그다음에 네, 3천 좀 넘어가지매. 음. 3천 좀 넘어서 그래서 6천, 7천 이렇게 받고 그다음에 이뻐요, 7천. 예. 네. 그다음 법적으로는 그래서 3천입니다. 그 여자 언제쯤 될것 같아요? 여자는 글쎄 이 시간 어. 시간에 따라서 그래서 한 어떻게 말씀드려? 일주일부터 열흘로 가니면 충분할 것 같습니다. 천천히 가. 그럼 한번 더 하네. 어, 그래. The man returns to North Korea. Two weeks later, back on the banks of the two men. In the middle of the night, a smuggler helps a woman cross over. On the Chinese side, a man approaches. He is a pimp. Like nearly all the women that make it across, she thinks she's paid the smuggler just to reach China. She is totally unaware she's been sold as a prostitute. <laughs> From now on, Unsil will have to work for the Chinese pimp, but we pay 500 euros, the going rate for her freedom. It's unwise to stay, and we take Unsil in our car. There was no stopping the young woman coming to China, because home could have meant starving to death. Ah. <laughs> The young woman does not want to be filmed, afraid the camera will betray her presence. After a 50-kilometer drive, we part company in Yanji, the Chinese town closest to the border. Yanji is the capital of the Yanbian region, and a large Sino-Korean community has lived here for centuries. The area is home to an estimated 300,000 illegal immigrants from North Korea, two-thirds of whom are women. Many become prostitutes working in the city's numerous massage parlors, as these pictures show. <laughs> Yeah. 
On the other side of town, one woman has escaped the clutches of the pimps. Kim Lin arrived six months ago. She lives hidden away in a small two-room apartment with her 15-year-old son and her daughter, Eun Hee, age 23. Kim Lin works from home. She sells her body over the internet. It's the one way she's found to keep her family alive without having to leave home. Kim Lin and her children only venture outside to buy food. They know they're vulnerable and could be given away by their Korean accents. The Chinese authorities arrest illegal immigrants and return them to North Korea where they will face the same fate that is meted out to traitors. Kim's daughter was repatriated after escaping to China a first time. Back in North Korea, Eun Hee was tortured in the dictatorship's prisons. That was six months ago. The North Koreans reserve their harshest treatment for women who have become pregnant by Chinese men. And he was in prison for several months. After she was released, and he managed to return to China with a single aim in mind, reaching South Korea. Via the internet, she made contact with a network that organizes the escape routes. It's a site refugees know well. Seoul in South Korea. Eun Hee was in touch with this man, Pastor Chong Ki Won, the head of the Duriana network that has so far helped more than 600 North Korean refugees on the run. Chung Ki Won is South Korean, a conservative and a Christian evangelist. In return for his help, the refugees agree to convert to Christianity. The minister chats online with one of his protégés, whom he's helped reach the United States. Every day he receives dozens of messages from China appealing for help and every year he helps a hundred or so North Koreans to escape. For the refugees, liberty comes at a price, 2,000 euros a person. The money is divided between the missionaries to pay for the human smugglers and for the trip itself. The pastor has been criticized for profiting off the backs of the North Korean exiles. Chung Ki Won has paid a heavy price for his involvement. In 2002, he and the group of illegal immigrants he was accompanying were arrested in China. He spent eight months in prison and the refugees sent back to North Korea, where they were executed. Yeah.
Back at Unhee's house, and it's her turn to head for South Korea. She's only allowed one piece of baggage, a small backpack. It's time for some last family photos with her mother and brother. Unhi is leaving first. Her family will join her if all goes to plan. Okay. The journey will last 10 days. Unhi will cross China and Laos illegally. If she's arrested during the trip, she'll be returned to North Korea and as a second time offender will face the firing squad. A 5,000 kilometer journey of fear across Asia but each step taking her closer to freedom in South Korea. Unhi bids farewell to her mother and brother, uncertain whether they'll ever see each other again. Once outside, her emotions overwhelm her. From now on, her life is in the hands of Pastor Chung Ki Won's network, Christian missionaries who refuse to be filmed. They take her first to Shenyang, a city of three million, west of Yanji. After seven hours on the road, we reach a residential part of the city. The missionaries take us to a hideout, a shelter for the refugees. A young woman lets us in. Inside, a dozen people are waiting to leave for Seoul. Most of them are young women. Some still have family in North Korea and don't want their faces shown. There's also a 10-year-old boy. His name's Min Chul. Every day he rings his mother, who's already safely in South Korea, and whom he's now meant to join. The little boy hasn't seen his mother in three years. Min Shul was brought up by an uncle. His father was a smuggler on the border. The boy has been hiding here for a week. Min Chul's mother has saved up 2,000 euros for his journey to Seoul. His uncle brought him along to the safe house. The youngster knows none of the grown-ups with whom he's meant to make the journey. 
In a nearby room, a couple and their three-month-old baby has just arrived. They fled North Korea to avoid a heavy prison sentence. The departure is set for the following morning. The couple, however, haven't scraped together enough cash to allow them to leave, so are likely to have to wait for a few more weeks. It's the last meal they'll eat together, and with just a few hours to go, the tension is mounting. Some pray, others prefer to seek reassurance. Bible in hand, the woman in charge gives out a few last-minute instructions. The most important thing is to never attract attention. The smallest mistake could literally prove fatal. Mobile phones and microchips are handed out before nightfall. It's hoped they won't have to be used, as the Chinese police have become adept at intercepting and tracing calls. Before sunrise the next day, and time to say goodbye before setting off in complete silence to avoid detection. The first group heads off, the others will leave later. Min Chul's party heads off first. We follow along behind. The first leg is an all-night bus trip. From Shenyang, as far as Beijing. In the early hours, they reach the Chinese capital. The refugees don't know the city, yet they have just two hours to find the station to catch the train bound for Kunming, the large city in the south of the country. We pretend to be tourists, so we can continue filming at the station. On board the train, Un He, Min Chul, and the other women in the group. The two and a half thousand kilometer train ride through China will take 38 hours, with each minute bringing with it the threat of arrest. To lessen the chance of that happening, the North Koreans scatter and sit in different carriages. We continue to film with our hidden camera. There's Min Chul. Even one word and the game might be up. The other passengers could inform on him. 
danger is everywhere. In each carriage, a ticket inspector could ask questions. A woman of 63 joins the group. Her name is Lynn Park. She's too scared to leave her seat, but another escapee prefers to hide in the toilets. And throughout the train, there are policemen. One day and one night later, they finally arrive at Kunming Station. A new handler takes them in charge. The fugitives climb aboard a car and head off towards the border with Laos, 500 kilometers to the south. Once in the car, they can finally talk again after two days of absolute silence. Like most of the others, Unhi has some opium. She'd rather commit suicide if she's caught than be sent back to North Korea. The border with Laos is now very close. We managed to sneak only a few pictures as security here has been strengthened. In the past few months, the number of arrests has multiplied and it's impossible to get across this way. There is just one way to get over, and that's through the jungle, escorted by another smuggler called Kim Jin. He agrees to talk. His predecessor was arrested by the Chinese police. Kim Jin is North Korean, where he survived three years in the toughest concentration camp in the country. Shortly after his release, he fled to Seoul, thanks to the pastor's escape network. The guide is due to meet up with the refugees in a shelter in the middle of the jungle where they're waiting for the green light. Unable to sleep, Unhi and her companions have been watching TV with the volume turned down as a precaution to while away the time. Before heading out, a few tips. Age 63, Lin Park needs to dig deep to find the physical strength to cross the jungle, but her dream of reaching America drives her on. I'm going to go to the 
1 a.m. and it will soon be time to leave. Kim Jin is unsure which is the best way to go. A few handfuls of rice are distributed to see them through a journey that could last several days. In the van, faces are tense. The walk ahead is no tourist trek. The Laotian jungle is one of the wildest in Asia. The border guards patrol day and night. It's vital they cross into Laos without being detected. Hey, Flashlights are distributed, and there's a final briefing. Shoes and belts are fastened to reduce the chances of being bitten by bugs. If all goes well, ten hours from now, Lin Park, Unhi, and the others will be in Laos. The smuggler takes the lead as the group heads off towards the border. The flashlights are switched off and they walk hand in hand. But in the dark and without a GPS, getting lost is easy. After a three hour long hike, the group pauses. The border guards are close by. <laughs> However difficult, they have to get across. They take a wide detour and wade across a river. The stones are slippery, and the refugees and our camera fall into the water. The next morning, Min Chul and the others are still in the middle of the jungle. Our main camera no longer works, so we use a spare. After the overnight march, everyone is resting or treating cuts and bruises. Their feet are their greatest asset, and there's still a long way to go, if they can figure out where they are. Eventually, the fugitives resume their walk. The path is now through deep jungle. Progress is slow and difficult. But Min Chul bravely gets over tree trunks and other obstructions. It will take the North Koreans another eight hours before crossing the border, just on the other side of the stream. Min Chul is struggling, his clothes shredded by the jungle. Lin Park is close to collapse, but determined not to leave her behind, the group helps her every last step of the way. 
After 36 hours, they finally reached Laos and the designated meeting place, not before time. Another guide is due to show up. After just a few minutes' wait, he arrives, and everyone scrambles. A minibus has been arranged, and there's no time to lose, because if they are arrested in Laos, they will be expelled and sent back to North Korea and executed. They may be in Laos, but they are still not free. There's more than 1,000 kilometers to go before they reach Bangkok. Four and a half thousand kilometers away in Seoul, Pastor Chung Ki Won is en route to Bangkok, where he wants to personally greet the refugees, assuming, of course, they make it. Five thousand meters below is the Laotian jungle that the refugees have just crossed after pushing themselves to their limits. It's a physical ordeal the pastor always hides from those he helps. Yet the hazardous journey is by no means over. There's still a full day and night's trek to the border with Thailand, if all goes to plan. The refugees try and pass themselves off as South Korean tourists. Exhausted, the group takes a break in a restaurant. Min Chul is sick. <laughs> <笑>なんかね、밥을 <웃음> 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 They've been on the road for seven days since leaving the apartment in Shenyang. Some are too tired even to eat. Unhi is also sick. Where? 
진짜 진짜 힘들어요. 아우. 이렇게 해서라도 꼭 가야 되겠어? 네. 왜? 음, 가면 자유가 생기고 할 수가 없으니까 자기가 본인이 일하는 것만큼 살이 지지가 않으니까 많이 힘들죠. 하나 그런 생각 들면? 네, 조금씩 반감이 생겨요. As night falls, the minibus sets off. Fifty kilometers further on, another challenge awaits the group. The Mekong River that marks the border with Thailand. Yet another guide arrives. Unhi is first off the minibus. It's a few more steps to the banks of the Mekong River. On the far side, the bright lights of Thailand. Freedom is agonizingly close, but they are still at risk. The drone of an outboard motor passes close by. It's a Laotian river patrol, just a few meters away. The runaways hide under a blanket of darkness. The danger passed, it's time to move on as quickly as possible. heads towards Thailand. A few hundred meters away is safety and freedom. Finally, they reach Thailand and the danger is over. There's another minibus ride for the five-hour trip to the nearest railway station, where Pastor Chong Ki Won is waiting for them. The fact they are free still hasn't sunk in. The faces of Un Hee and her friends are taut, their features strained. The pastor counts his flock. But once on board the bus, they finally let their emotions go. Destination Bangkok, the capital of Thailand. They are put up in a house rented by the minister. After prayers, they call their loved ones. Min Chul reassures his mother, who is waiting for him in Seoul. Lin Park phones her children.
그렸어요? <웃음> 할 말은 응? 나중에 만나면 만나지 못해도 음 엄마 어떻게 운이 좋아서 지금 태국에 왔다 방콕에 엄마 미안해 나만 걱정 많이 했지 어, 다 엄마 기도했음 덕분에 편안히 왔어. 끊을게 엄마. 여기까지 오니까 이것저것 다 생각이 나는 게 다른 분들도 다 갔겠지만 옛날 생각이 막 나는 게 기가 막혀서. 서 The following morning and the young women say their goodbyes. Strong bonds have been created by the drama of the past 10 days. Together, they have traveled thousands of kilometers. They have braved the jungle and run the gauntlet of police, border guards, and informers. Separately, they head to the South Korean embassy to ask for political asylum. He is worried, but she has no need to be. South Korea automatically grants exile to all North Koreans who show up at the embassy. Along with her companions, Un Hee finally steps onto South Korean territory. She is just one of 2,770 North Koreans who in 2008 successfully managed the great escape to Seoul. A few months later in Seoul, and the refugees live in a huge and modern metropolis of 10 million. They are being looked after by the authorities. They have spent two months in a re-education center, which is off limits to the press. They learn how to live and adapt to their new lives in a modern consumer society with credit cards and shopping malls. Min Chul lives in this new apartment block and has been reunited with his mother. 제가 만드는 건데. His mother works and the state subsidizes the rent. Today, Min Chul lives a life like any other South Korean youngster. 엄마! 내일 목요일이지? 아싸! 네. 내일 모레 거기 간다, 서풍. He goes to school, does his homework on a computer, and is proud of his new class. Minchul's a happy, well-rounded little boy, but the trauma of the ordeal he had to undergo has left its mark. To the North Korean exiles, life in Seoul is itself a new challenge. Cases of depression and even suicide are not uncommon. Pastor Chung Ki Won admits adjusting to life in South Korea can be difficult. The people who come to Korea to 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 the people 어, 오히려 탈출하는 과정에 태국인 미얀마로 가는 과정보다도 한국에서의 삶이 더 힘들어요. 근데 왜 그러냐면은 
전혀 다른 문화에서 다른 상황에서 살다가 여기 와서 일가 친척도 없이 배운 것도 없이 스스로 살아가야 된다고 생각할 때 사실 그게 더 힘들어해요. Unhi is now living on her own in a shelter run by Christians. She's trying to get used to her new life as quickly as possible, and she visits the pastor's chapel several times a week. Her dream is to be a musician. 한국은 한국은 음악이 많이 개방돼 있어서 서양 음악이랑 많이 이렇게 접할 수가 있잖아요. 그런 데 대해서 되게 넓은 분야로 알게 될 알게 되는 것 같아요. 그래서 음악 공부 많이 하고 싶어요. 공부가 제일 먼저 하고 싶고요. 그 다음에 두 번째 덤 벌고 싶고 세 번째는 돌아다니고 싶더라고요. 워낙에 구경하고 싶은 게 많으니까. But after three months, she still hasn't found work, and despite the best efforts of the people around her, she's finding it hard to integrate. 워낙에 모든 분들이 좋은 모습만 저한테 보여주시니까 안 좋은 점은 좀 발견하기 힘든 것 같다는. 제 입장에선 그래요. 다른 사람들은 어떻게 했는지 모르겠는데 제 느낌은 그래요. 근데 한국에 와서도 한국의 그안 좋은 점이라는 게 물론 자본주의 사회는 다 그렇겠지만. 빈부 차이가 너무 심하다. 그런 데서 좀 좌절감이 많이 와요. <웃음> 나는 너무 가진 게 없다. 뭐 이런 생각에. There are 15,000 North Koreans in Seoul. Like when he and the others, they were all fortunate to slip through the net. But not everyone was so lucky. When the group was preparing to leave Beijing, you may recall that others were waiting their turn. This couple and their baby among them. They were due to set off just a few days later, but they never did. It would appear the Chinese police arrested them. We head back to Shenyang to see if we can pick up their trace. The guide takes us to the entrance of the apartment. <laughs> There's no one. It's deserted. Yeah. Cigarette stubs litter the floor in front of the entrance. This is what betrayed them. A few cigarettes on the doorstep are all it took to send them back to their country and execution. Each month, Chinese police expel up to 100 refugees, condemning them to almost certain death in North Korea.